How would you like to have $100,000 per year of tax-free money in retirement? It's actually possible. In this video, I'll explain how capital gains taxes work and how many people can avoid paying capital gains altogether through a technique called capital gains harvesting. In fact, this is a technique you need to be fully aware of and take full advantage of throughout your career and into retirement. I'll also show you why having a personal brokerage account can be an excellent source of tax-free retirement funds. I'll go over examples showing how capital gains won't push you into higher income tax brackets, but higher ordinary income can lead to higher taxable brackets for any capital gains. If all that sounds confusing, it won't be after the examples in this video. Please don't forget to hit the like button and I'd sure appreciate hearing your comments below. Let me first quickly run through a few of the basic definitions. Capital gains are the profits you make from the sale of an asset, like stocks, ETFs, cryptocurrencies, or maybe other types of investments, like maybe a piece of land. If you own the asset for less than one year, it's called short-term capital gains and it's taxed as ordinary income. So basically, other than payroll taxes, it's taxed just like your wages. But if you own the asset for more than one year, it's called long-term capital gains and it's taxed at a much different rate than your income. If you invested $10,000 into stocks in a personal brokerage account, and then years later sold them for $25,000, you would have made $15,000 with a profit, and you'd only pay capital gains on the profit. So let's take a look at the relevant tax brackets. Here are the federal income tax brackets for ordinary income in 2024. So let's go through a quick example using these tax brackets. Let's say a married couple files jointly and makes $100,000 in wages. For this example, I'll keep this simple and say that's their only income, they have no children, and they are not participating in any tax-deferred retirement accounts. They could first deduct the standard deduction, which for a couple is $29,200 in 2024, leaving them with $70,800 in total taxable income. They would pay 10% on the first $23,200. Then they would pay 12% on the rest of the income that is over that threshold of $23,200. The total of their taxable income that spills over $23,200 is $47,600. So they pay 10% on $23,200 and 12% on $47,600, and their total federal income tax would be $8,032. Of course, they also had to pay the FICA taxes of 7.65%. That's the combination of Social Security and Medicare taxes. You don't get out of those, so that's another $7,650. But there's nothing you can do about that. So we're going to focus on the federal income taxes and the capital gains taxes in this video. Now, let's check out long-term capital gains tax brackets. What if the same married couple only had $100,000 of long-term capital gains during this year and no other income? After their standard deduction of $29,200, they again have the $70,800 of taxable income. However, on the capital gains tax bracket, all of it falls under the $94,050 threshold for a married couple filing jointly, and they would owe zero federal taxes. The process can get a bit messier when we are combining ordinary income and capital gains, but in practice, the rules are pretty straightforward. Your ordinary income comes first, and then Think of your capital gains taxes, especially your long-term capital gains, and qualified dividends as being stacked on top. Then think of the standard deduction as being applied to the ordinary income. Let's look at an example to see how this would work. 
Take our married couple that made $100,000 in wages. Now, let's say they sold some stocks and they realized $60,000 of long-term capital gains. They now have $160,000 of total gross income. But those capital gains do not push them into higher personal income tax brackets. Only the earned income from their salaries is used to calculate the taxes due on their wages. So the taxes they owe on their wages stays exactly the same. It's still the $8,032 of income taxes. Remember, the capital gains is stacked on top. The wages of $100K minus the standard deduction left $70,800. So $23,250 of the capital gains still falls under the $94,050 threshold, and you are paying 0% on that. But they did have a total of $60,000 of long-term capital gains. So $36,750 of that amount is pushed over the $94,050 threshold, and it would be taxed at 15% for a total of $5,513. So now their total federal taxes they would owe would be the $8,032 in income taxes and the $5,513 in capital gains taxes. So now that you understand how ordinary income and capital gains interact with each other, let's get into the tax harvesting techniques that can save you a great deal of money over the course of your life. Take our married couple earning $100,000 in salary. After the standard deduction of $29,200, remember they had $70,800 of taxable income. And we calculated that they would owe $8,032 of federal income taxes. Let's say they have a personal brokerage account with stocks in it that have doubled in price and they have 100% gain on those. These are not in a retirement account. Or just in a personal brokerage account. They could sell $46,500 of those stocks that they've held for over a year, and it would be long-term capital gains. So selling $46,500 worth of stocks, they would realize $23,250 worth of the long-term capital gains. But that $23,250 stacked on top of the $70,800 gives a total taxable income of $94,050, and they would owe zero capital gains. Doing a practice like this is called capital gains harvesting. It is like a strategic chess move in the world of investing. It can be a real game changer because it can reduce your future taxable gains in a very significant way. Of course, this only applies to a taxable account. There's no need to do this in a retirement account. Then they could turn around and invest the money again, and they would have increased their cost basis, in turn lowering their future capital gains taxes. Just a quick note about dividends. What's called qualified dividends is taxed exactly like long-term capital gains. Otherwise, non-qualified dividends are added on top of your ordinary income and taxed at the same rate as the last dollar you made. Unless you are an active trader, though, I wouldn't worry much about this. Most dividends meet the criteria qualifying them to be taxed as capital gains, long-term capital gains, that is. I'll leave a definition of the requirements needed to be classified as qualified dividends in the description below. Remember the example of the couple making $100,000 during their working career and they paid $8,032 in federal income taxes? Now I want to show you an example of how a couple with $100,000 of income in retirement can pay zero taxes. Nothing whatsoever. In this example, we will say that one person in retirement is withdrawing $2,800 in Social Security, and the other is receiving $2,200.
So they have a total of $5,000 per month coming in or $60,000 per year in Social Security. Now, Social Security is kind of odd in the way it's taxed, and it can seem a little confusing. It might not be taxed at all, but whether it is or isn't is based on what's called your provisional income. This income includes your adjusted gross income, any non-taxable interest, and then you only add in half of your Social Security payments. Then, if this combined income for a couple filing jointly is under $32,000, the tax rate is zero. Between $32,000 and $44,000, up to 50% of your Social Security becomes taxable, and over $44,000, up to 85% is taxable income. Okay, now let's see how this married couple in retirement with $100,000 of income could pay zero taxes. Let's say this couple has $500,000 in a traditional 401k and $150,000 in a Roth IRA and maybe $400,000 in a personal brokerage account. And the personal brokerage account is invested into an ETF for the SP500 with a cost basis of $200,000. So they have 100% of gain on those assets in their personal brokerage account. And we'll say that it pays a 2% dividend. So it generates $8,000 in dividends per year. So the dividends and the Social Security are things that just happen every single year. No decisions to be made there. But the beauty of these different buckets of assets is what allows you to create your own tax brackets. Remember, their standard deduction was $29,200. But once somebody is over the age of 65, they both get a, a, an additional $1,550 or $3,100 between them. So their standard deduction in retirement is now $32,300 in the year 2024 anyway. So they bring in $5,000 per month or $60,000 per year in Social Security and they receive $8,000 in dividends for a total of $68,000 worth of revenue for them so far. If they only had Social Security, their combined income would be 50% of that $60,000 or $30,000, and that would be under the $32,000 threshold for which Social Security is taxable, and they would owe zero taxes. Then, the $8,000 of dividends would give them a combined income of $38,000. So that pushes some of the Social Security into a taxable range because they are now over the $32,000 of combined income threshold by $6,000. So 50% of that, or $3,000, is taxable. But we add that to the $8,000 of capital gains and the total taxable income is $11,000. But that is still far below their standard deduction and they still have zero taxes. So far, they have $68,000 of money for them to spend and we are still far below their standard deduction. Now let's take some money from their 401k, which would be taxable income. And it would also put more of their Social Security into a taxable range. As income rises, it naturally pushes you into higher tax brackets, but it also simultaneously pulls more of your Social Security into the provisional or combined income. So it's kind of a double whammy. Let's pull out $12,000 from your 401k. Now, they have $80,000 of money to enjoy. But this causes a little bit more of your Social Security to become taxable. In fact, now $11,100 of your Social Security becomes taxable. So their total income is now the $8,000 of dividends, the $12,000 of 401k withdrawals, and $11,100 of taxable Social Security for a total of $31,100 of taxable income, and they are still under the standard deduction, so no taxes.
but we still need 20,000 to get them to that 100,000. If we pulled it all out of the 401k, it would push them into a tax bracket where they would be paying taxes. Let's leave the Roth IRA alone, letting it grow, and we'll go ahead and sell $20,000 worth of stock from our personal brokerage account. Now, they are up to $100,000 to enjoy. Let's see what happens here. They pulled out $20,000, but only $10,000 of that was profit or long-term capital gains. And the other $10,000 was just the return of their own principal. So they need to add another $10,000 to their total combined income. This in turn causes 19,600 of their social security to be included in their total taxable income. So the total taxable income is the $8,000 in dividends, the $10,000 of long-term capital gains, the $12,000 of 401k withdrawals, 19,600 of taxable Social Security for a total taxable income of $49,600. Take off the standard deduction of $32,300 and they are only left with $17,300 of taxable income. Now you might be thinking this couple's going to owe some taxes. But remember the capital gains does not push ordinary income into higher tax brackets. And the standard deduction wipes away all of the ordinary income. All that taxable income of $17,300 from their dividends and sale of stock is taxed at long-term capital gains rates. But remember, the rate on that is zero for amounts under $94,050. So this couple now has $100,000 to enjoy in tax-free money because they were careful about how they pulled out of different buckets of funds available to them. Notice we didn't even need to use the Roth account, and having a taxable personal brokerage account can be helpful in managing tax brackets in retirement. However, having only traditional retirement accounts can present real tax problems, especially when they hit the required minimum distributions. Your goal is to minimize taxes in the current year and your overall lifetime taxes. Thus, you want to take full advantage of capital gains harvesting throughout your career, anytime it's available, and in retirement too. It is certainly a strategy that can help you save a great deal of money. Thus, it might be helpful to talk to a tax professional about your unique situation. I hope you hit the like button, leave some comments below. Thank you for watching.